Hello everyone. Thank you for coming to listen to our presentation on representative modeling of very long HVDC cables. This project came from SunCable, who are currently developing a gigascale project, which I have been lucky enough to work on. This presentation is broken into four parts. Firstly, the motivation for this project is given as we are considering HVDC cables longer than those currently installed anywhere in the world. Then a brief description about developing the cable model, and then we'll focus on the main contribution of this work, which is to understand the impact of field joints on the frequency response of the HVDC cable and apply the system model to DC fault location. Very long HVDC are those that exceed the longest HVDC cables in the world of about 600 kilometers, and to exceed it by a significant margin to around 4,000 kilometers. There are a number of projects in the pipeline looking at distances this, this long, such as Sun Cables Australia Asia Powerlink, which is abbreviated to AA Powerlink, or the x -Links project between Morocco and the United Kingdom. And the idea of supergrids has been boosted by Prime Minister Modi of India and Prime Minister Johnson, who, re who presented the Green Grids Initiative, One Sun, One World, One Grid at COP earlier in November. So, Long HVDC cables have a bright future in renewable energy transport, which is the goal of the Sun Cable project in transporting electricity produced by photovoltaic panels in the Australian outback to Singapore located more than 3,300 kilometres away from Darwin in a straight line. Australia has excellent solar resources shown by the consistent red across the outback, and the colour scale here determines the the quantity of solar resource. This electricity would supply a country dependent on fossil fuels and restricted by available area. The size of the intended solar farm is 120 square kilometers, which is smaller than the size of Singapore at 700 and 700, 300 kilometers. However, as seen by this nighttime view of Singapore from space, there is a lot of area there's not a lot of area for development. Is that the parts that do not show light are likely water. An overall picture of the AA power link is found in this map. It shows the key components to the project. Our focus is on modeling the HVDC cables between Darwin and Singapore, which will include converter models and representation of the other systems as AC sources. The AA power link also includes electricity transmission from Power Creek to Darwin and the generation and storage located there, but these are not modelled. Moving on to the cable modelling. It's important to have a cable model for dynamic simulation. The model is implemented in PSCAD through EMTDC for later simulation. The model was built from the center out, starting with the core conductor. We validated the layers of the model through simulation in MATLAB and results from literature and tested some of the assumptions that PSK makes. The properties of the installation and semiconducting layers were a primary focus in the testing. The properties for each layer were informed from an initial specification of the cables, but these were supplemented with values from supplier data sheets. The model also includes the outer layers, which is the sheath, jacket, bedding, armor, and serving. The HVDC link has three cables, a positive, a negative, and a metallic return, which has a thinner main insulation. The greatest challenge in modeling the cable accurately was in representing the field joints, which we will discuss. 
It is helpful to go over the basis of travelling wave theory for DC fault location. Electrical waves are present in transmission lines because of the distributed inductance and capacitance along the length of the cable. And at the same time, it's convenient to distribute the conductor resistance and insulation. Insulation conductance as well. These parameters are primarily frequency dependent so that the relationship between voltage and current can be expressed by differential equations. The equations are solved and give waves as solutions, which are characterized by attenuation, velocity, uh, and characteristic impedance. To show the wave like nature of the cable, a video of an HVDC cable being energized was produced in MATLAB. The video is a little small, but on the x axis we have cable length, and at the same and as time passes, the energization shows a step response moving towards the single port on the right. And the step itself is being attenuated as it moves. Clearly, you can see the traveling wave nature during the energization process. As waves bounce back and forth. These simulations use the 3700 kilometer model of the cable, and later MATLAB simulations will also. Moving on to the field joints. The impact of the field joints is dependent on how well the sheath and arm and conductors are bonded to earth and the number of field joints. Our analysis just assumes that the sheath and armor and earth are electrically isolated between each of the field joints and compare scenarios with different number of field joints within the cable. To think about the impact, Consider a fault in the core conductor. The fault impedance will be small as the electrical insulation will be breaking down. Electrical waves will spread in both directions from the fault as the sudden voltage collapse radiates outwards. These waves in the core conductor are induced into the sheath and armor due to capacitive and inductive coupling between the three conductors. Field joints reflect electrical waves in the sheath and armor back towards the fault, which then induce electrical waves back into the core. This creates a small distortion for voltage, which will appear in the converter terminal voltage. These reflections occur in all cable solutions, but not just the ones closest to the fault. And will contribute to the total distortion. We first analyze the impact of field joints by calculating input impedance of the cable at Darwin as a function of frequency. A linear system of equations is solved in MATLAB for each frequency to complete this. Each cable section is represented by a matrix equation AC shown here. Which comprises of an impedance, emittance, and dimensionless components. Each field joint is represented by a matrix as well, 
with the leftmost component a l shown here at the bottom of the page representing the left approach of the field joint and similarly on the right we have the component a r cable and cable sections and field joints are daisy chained together to construct a diagonal matrix at the terminal a matrix a d is added at darwin And the termination impedance of 200 ohms is added at single port in the matrix AF. Inverting this matrix equation, the input impedance is calculated by dividing the first voltage by the first current. These equations are solved for each frequency and scenario of the number of field joints. Results are shown in the magnitude and phase of the input impedance. Our primary goal is to determine the minimum number of field joints to match the scenario of 61 field joints, which is shown here in these plots by the yellow dashed curves. A likely number required when the cable, well, sorry. Sixty-one field joints is the likely number required when the cable is constructed. Knowing this will help simplify the representation of the cable in PSCAD. And clearly having no field joints, which is shown by the blue curve, isn't quite desirable, but it only takes seven field joints in the red curve to be close. The impact of field joints on the voltage profile along the cable is also analysed for a single 10 Hz frequency applied at the Darman terminal. This is the, this is the voltage magnitude. Focusing just on the blue curves, which are for the core conductor, there is a clear impact. And seven field joints remains a reasonable approximation. Now it's a little hard to see each of the lines, but the light faint blue line is for no field joints and the dark blue line is for seven field joints and there's a small dash dotted line for 61 field joints that just sits below that and those two match the 61 core and the seven in the seven field joints case and now also in this plot we also have two other colors red and yellow they represent the the sheath and armor um, and they're a little bit more hard to see. The impact on how well the sheath and armor, sheath, armor, and earth are bonded together has on the cable model are assessed by simulations of DC faults in PSCAD. The full HVDC link is modeled for the study, including all three cables, each are separated into 15 sections, including as well other the, the modular multi-level converters and the AC sources representing the rest of the system. The cable length for the study is 4,400 kilometers. The first study considering fault, considers faults of 100 kilometers in length from Darwin which is considered a close fault to the terminals. This result shows what would happen if the assumption of perfect insulation in the outer layers was incorrect. This could be because there are regular factory joints or the most outer layer is permeable. Three scenarios have been created. The first is perfect insulation between conducting layers, which is shown here by the dark blue curve. The second has the voltage potential of the armor layer equal to the earth potential along the entire length which is shown here by the light blue color and the third has both the sheath and armor at earth potential which is the green the results do show a slight difference in magnitude in the oscillation but does not affect the period of oscillation which is a helpful for locating faults as we will explain later
Results are shown for plots further away and also shows close agreement between the scenarios. Now moving on to applying the model to DC fault location. The goal is to identify techniques in DC fault location using the voltage and current measurements at the terminals. This is one because why not use the resources already available for control and management of the HVDC link? Of course, this won't be the only method for fault location. Although a DC fault is a strong signal where fault location should be identifiable. Any means of refining the location of a fault will minimize the downtime of the link and improve the availability and increase the output of the project economic output. A series of simulations was conducted at different locations along the cable length to see how the transients differ. So in this plot, we have time on the x-axis in milliseconds, and on the y, we have the voltage at Darwin, uh, measured in kilovolts, about a center voltage zero, and we go up to about 600 kilovolts in this plot. There is a significant difference in how the transients appear based on fault location. Transients close to terminal result in voltage oscillations as electrical waves generated the fault bounce between the terminal and the fault itself. The timing between reflections is a good indicator of fault location as noted by the regularity in the reflection marks for 100 km and 300 km faults. Using these uh, reflection times, we can work from an estimate of the wave speed and then we can give find a distance between the fault and the terminal. However, for faults far away, these reflections are lost, but the, the maximum rate at which the voltage decays initially is a good indicator of how much the waves have been attenuated in the distance from the fault. And this is shown here in this plot by these dashed lines for the further away faults. And we can see a clear um, progression of shallower lines there. In conclusion, field joints do have an impact on the input impedance of the cable and the voltage profile. But if considering the possible conductivity between the sheath, armor, and earth, it has minor impact on the voltage transient. Lastly, transient simulation showed two possible methods of fault location. The first is the time between reflections, and the second being the slope of the initial decay in voltage. Thank you very much for listening.